Okay, my name is Ron Carrico. I'm with the San Diego Air and Space Museum. And today is, oh wow, it's Valentine's Day, Valentine's. February 14th, 2018. And I, uh, Hank Getz, and he <clears throat> is going to tell us about his career in the Air Force. And so let's start off with, um, where, where were you born? I was born in a little town on Long Island called Elmont. And Elmont's the town where the Belmont racetrack's in. And what, uh, what year were you born? 1936, at home, on the kitchen table. <laughs> cool. Well, what did your, your parents do? My dad was, uh, most his adult life he worked for Grumman as, a, as an assembler. He just put things together. Uh, neither one of my, I was raised right there in Elmont, grew up, went to a high school. Uh, that was a central high. And I got, if, if uh, from a location point of view, if you can picture... Uh, Kennedy on one, one corner, LaGuardia on another, and Mitchell Field on the third, forming a tri tri uh, triangle. We were sort of living in the middle of that. So I saw airplanes all the time, and ever since I was about six years old, I think I wanted to fly. Oh, really? That early, huh? Yeah. Wow. wow. And I, I had an opportunity when I was in high school. They, they had a, a club called the Civil Air Patrol, and I joined it and took some classes and got involved there. got my first airplane ride. What was that? Uh, you know, I don't remember what kind of airplane it was, but it was something similar to just a, a Piper Cub. And it was at a, a dirt strip on Long Island uh, called Zahn's Airport. It's not there anymore. And little did I know from that first airplane ride at Zahn's, it was a, it was a grass of dirt, I can't remember. There was a highway right alongside of it. I could throw a rock across the highway and hit Republic aircraft. Hmm. So. No, then and, and, and by the way, the reason I brought it up is because little did I know on that first airplane ride that ten years within ten years I was picking up brand new airplanes at the Republic factory coming right off the assembly line, F-105 Thunder Chiefs, and I picked up one that had an hour and ten minutes on it. Oh, wow. That was it. I actually went to Rutgers University uh, on, a, on a pretty much a full boat lacrosse um, and chose that particular school because it had Air Force ROTC, and I could see a light at the end of the tunnel to get into flying. And uh, graduated Rutgers in 1958, went straight into the Air Force and to pilot training. So you actually entered the Air Force as a second lieutenant then? Yes, okay. yes. Went to Malden, Missouri, which was a, a primary uh, training field. It had T-34s, T-28s, and then Went down so, right you know, okay, come, now, compare and compare the T thirty four. What's the difference between that and the T T twenty eight? T thirty four is is probably the easiest airplane to fly. You could get your hands on, uh, and everybody remembers it because it was fully aerobatic, and you could do anything, and it was very forgiving. So, you know, it's hard to get into trouble in it, and we got about thirty five hours in that, and then went to the T-28, which at the time I thought was the biggest airplane I'd ever seen. Uh, and it was more like a World War II uh, fighter. Uh, big, noisy, a uh, huge engine out front. I can't remember what kind of engine it had, but... Uh, it's about 850 horsepower, as I recall. Yeah. Something like that. Red, red Line was in the 300s, 320, oh, three, well, something like that. It's a World War II fighter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, and he got about 125 hours in that. Oh wow, that's a lot. And uh, well, yeah, uh, mainly because they took you through all the stages of flying, right up through formation, aerobatics, uh, you know, some instruments, so forth. And uh, after that, I went to Laredo, Texas for T-33s. And uh, so what now? Okay, so you go from a T-28, a big radial, <coughs> fully aerobatic. Now you're going to do it in a jet. What was it like to go from one to the other? For me, it was pretty easy. Uh, usually, you have to mentally you have to think faster. You have to be ahead of the airplane all the time. So that was probably the you know running to keep up with it for the first few hours. And after a while, it was very easy. I, I, I'm really one of the lucky ones. I, I found flying it to be the easiest thing I've ever done in my life, and it's just so much fun. I stayed with it for over 40 years. So, what what, what would be a landing speed of a T28? Oh, I'm thinking uh, 120, 125. You mean down on final, you mean? Yeah. 
And then a, a T bird, what was the T bird, a final approach speed? Oh, I'm sorry, you said T28. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, T28, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, kind of, it's over 60 years ago. So, no, not quite 60 years ago, but um, I, don't, I, I really yeah. don't know. Pro, pro, maybe in the 90s. Okay, and then but then the T thirty three is going to be about one hundred twenty on final, probably adjust for fuel a little yeah, bit. Yeah, one hundred twenty to one hundred twenty five. And touchdown eighty nine hundred. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Straight wing, a lot of flaps. Did the T birds have chip uh, tanks at that point? Yes, they did. So how long could you fly them? Uh, we we my cross country. I went from uh, Laredo. I think we went nonstop to to uh, Las Vegas. Else. Oh wow. wow! So so now obviously you did well because you got a fighter assignment. I I did. I, uh, I graduated and taught my class and got a fighter assignment out of Laredo when I got my wings. Went straight to Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix. Uh, went through basic gunnery there. Uh, Nothing special. A couple of odds and ends things happened to me. Uh, well, okay, so with the F-100, you had 20 millimeter cans. 420s. 420s, and then you also had the typical uh, practice bomb with probably six bombs in it. Probably, yeah. And right. so when you'd go to the range and you'd go to Gila Bend, right? <clears throat> and so then you would, what would you use those six bombs for typically on a practice mission? Okay, we could use them for uh, skip bomb, which is simulated napalm drop. Mm -hmm. So that was 50 feet over over a box on the ground. We had to plunk a couple of bombs in there to qualify. In those days, we were they were just getting into the nuclear business with the F-100. Uh, prior to that, prior to my going through Luke and Ellis, it was primarily a day fighter, and and the units over in, for instance, in Europe were day fighter. Uh, when you say fighter, you mean air to air? Air to air. With the capabilities doesn't like of, a, it doesn't sound of like air to ground. It had, it had fully air to ground capabilities. But to give you an idea, when they were checking us out for initial nuclear delivery, it was going to be VFR day only because we had no radar or anything to work with. And just to, uh, as a practice maneuver for VFR nuclear delivery, You'd climb up to 32,000 feet, roll over on the target in a 70 degree dive angle, uh, pickle at 18 with the throttle way back, and pull out by 10, and then burn a climb back up to 32 and do that. That's what we did with those little practice bombs. Wow, I never heard of that before. And then you had to get certain scores to qualify. But this is, this was, they were considering the airplane for nuclear delivery but its only capability was daytime uh, VFR. The 105 Thunder Chief was even better than that. Theoretically, you didn't use every, all the systems all the time, but you could run it at, uh, say, 500 feet on the autopilot, track the target down with your radar scope, have a, a cursor out there, maybe 30,000 foot cursor. You line it up, once the cursor and the, the range crossed, you hit a pickle button, and you got a yellow light. The computer computed the release angle, your speed and everything else. We had air data computer in it. When the green light came on, if it was on the autopilot, it would pull 4G over the top. Bomb bay doors would open, throw the bomb out, come over the top, roll you out, and take you back to wherever you wanted to go. And it was all done automatically on the autopilot. Wow. And, of course, we did it manually also practice it manually in case the autopilot wasn't working. 105 had a, a number of different types of deliveries. You could go across the target and, and do a 4G pull, throw the bomb straight up, right. and then come down. You could put it on a toss bomb, a, a, a loft, sure. and uh, pull up and then calculate it at an angle and release the bomb, and right. you threw it and went this way. But it, it, you got to remember, I, I uh, left the Air Force in 1964. Yeah. So. There was, there's a lot of things happened after that. Yeah, because I, I got in in 65, so. Yeah. Uh, so, with the, that's it. I never heard of that delivery system. I've always heard about the loft delivery, and I was surprised a friend of mine flew F-4s in, in, in Japan, and they did the over-the-shoulder in Japan. We didn't do it in Europe. I don't Who knows why. Yeah. I mean, we, I, we did over-the-shoulder and 
loft. Yeah, well, that's both seems like a good idea to be going back the other way. <laughs> but we had the, I mean, I'm, maybe you never dealt with this. I mean, did you actually ever fly in Europe then? Flying in oh, Europe? You flew a Bitbird, sure, of course uh, you did. Well, I flew F 100s out of Ramstein. No, yeah, Ramstein. And, but, then, and then 105s out of Bitbird. But did, were you, did you fly there? With, you had to fly one day when they had the buffer zone, right? Yeah. Okay, and and what was because I remember distinctly what our recovery procedure was supposed to be, if we had dropped a nuclear bomb. <laughs> do you happen to remember what the recovery was for the? Yeah, I do. What was it? We didn't have one. We flew one-way missions, and theoretically, you were supposed to go in and hit the target, and then they on a map they'd say this is a safe area, go over here. And Hopefully there'll be some people who might want to help you if you bail out here. I always figured that was somebody else's target. And the reason that we flew one-way missions is because we were close enough to the East German border that we, we, had, we were supposed to get off the ground 15 minutes of when they blew the siren. And I remember talking to one of my maintenance guys and he says, Boy, I really feel sorry for you guys sitting one-way nuclear missions. I said, you know why they're, they're one-way? And he said, no. I said, it's because you guys aren't going to be here. You'll be dead before I will, because I won't die until I get to the target. You're going to, you're going to be probably taken out right after I take off. So, you know, we were just close enough to not even plan fuel to come back. Well, see, I, I flew out of Han. That's where I flew. Oh, did you? Which was just up the street. Sure. And, and our missions, we were always supposed to, you know, Figure on coming back, and I think, well, come on, you won't be here. No. I mean, Han, Bitburg, and Spang are just a straight line. Yeah. <laughs> One airplane can get all three of them. But the, the instructions to come back were to, you know, turn around, come back, go to your base, fly at 300 knots to 10,000 feet, squawking emergency. Oh, yeah, that'll work. Yeah. <laughs> and there well, was, we didn't, but they didn't bother to have us return fuel. Just enough to get out of well, the Well, target. our targets were, ours, we could have done it. I don't think, because our targets were in Czechoslovakia and East Germany, places like that. And they were like road intersections and airports and you know, that kind of stuff. Ours were more installations, Russian MiG fields and, and battalions. Well, I think that was part of it. But, but I figured we had a, went a big ORI one time and we were supposed to plan our routes in. And so we had the whole map and where all the explosions were and a target number. And you could tell we were number four and five to the target sometimes. And, you know. Yeah, they, and, they like to tell you that, don't they? <laughs> and it was like, are you kidding me? They, they never get, get, you'd never be able to get to the target without getting blown up. All right. And we had an eye patch. Do you guys have an eye patch? You know, the eye patch came in a little later. That was, that was really funny. Yeah. Uh, to give you an idea, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the 105 had, had a lot of capabilities. Cuban Missile Crisis, they took my squadron at Bitburg. And we downloaded our nukes, and they put a, put sidewinders on, and of course we always flew with hot guns, and put us on five minute zulu alert at the end of the runway. They were concerned that our blockade on Cuba would result in them blockading or harassing the three quarters that went in and out of Berlin at the time. Oh yeah, well, that makes sense. And so if if their make started harassing our airplanes, I have no. I kept asking for instructions. That, what do I do when I take off? Can I shoot anything that any make? And they, they, they never had an answer. They just wanted us available and mm -hmm. ready. It's interesting. I forgot that term, Zulu alert. You guys, said, the we, nuke alert was Victor alert. Victor, right? yeah. yeah. And Zulu, Victor was 15 minutes. Zulu was five. Yeah, we had a Zulu. We had uh, F-102s on the base that were on the Zulu alert. And a couple of times we actually set some Zulu, uh, Zulu alert with the F-4. All the fighter bases all over Europe had uh, a one F-102 intercept squadron on it. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, this is a really funny story. We were sitting uh, nuke alert at Bitburg, and of course we were supposed to get off the ground in 15 minutes, so a couple of our uh, smarter guys said, you know, we've never done it, we, so we don't really know if we can get off in 15 minutes. So they said, let's bring, they said they towed two birds with no nuclear weapons on it down to the alert pad and then blew the siren. Pilots ran out, jumped in the airplane, they opened the gates, and the pilots took off. The, the F-102 intercept squadron sits right next to the Zulu, uh, the, the nuclear alert area. And they're watching F-105s coming out of the nuclear alert area, the, the gates opening oh, up Jesus. and taking off 
And these guys are going crazy because they thought World War III's on and nobody's telling us anything. Yeah. Well, so uh, let's, let's talk about the WEF 100. So you check out the WEF 100, and the class you graduated from pilot training was? 60C. 60C. So then you spent six months at, uh, at Luke or so? Probably around five, six months at Luke, and then uh, another three months or four months at Nellis. And in between those two... What was Nell why was Nellis different than Luke? Nellis was the finishing touches. It was sort of like... Uh, Luke was basic airplane flying and gunnery. Mm -hmm. And when you got to Nellis, then you got the air refueling, the, uh, a, a little bit more sophistication in the airplane. Uh, it's kind of like uh, pre-fighter weapons school. Okay. So the finishing touches before they, they sent you out to your first squadron to go to work. Was That's a good segue to this story. You asked me if uh, I ever got near a saber dance. At Luke, before we start flying the airplane, it's the first thing they did is show us. Okay, let's talk about, let's start, all right, all right. You've got to explain what a saber dance is. A saber dance, uh, it's a, it's just a, a, a dictating. Well, what's, okay, well, let's start, let's, I'll, let's be more, more specific. An F-100 is actually known as a North American... Super saber. Super saber. And there was a situation... Okay, uh, a situation where the... This particular pilot was newly checked out in the airplane, and his job was to go pick up uh, brand new ones from North American and take them over to George Air Force Base. And he was coming into George when Tower or Mobile spotted the fact that his nose wheel, they hadn't put the pin in it. Mm. So his nose wheel was cocked. So he wasn't going to, they were afraid, you know, it might collapse or something would go wrong. So they called around, found out that they, they had up at Edwards, they could phone the runways. So they, he went up to Edwards, they phoned the runway, and he came in and he was trying to hit the phone and put it on as slow as possible. Now, the, the model that he flew, the F-100A and the C model, I spent most of my career in the, in the C model, most of my time in the F-100, no flaps, no trailing its flaps. They all had mechanical slats on the leading edge of the wing, but no trailing edge flaps on the A and the C. The D and the F, which the F being the two-seater, had flaps. So literally you flew it on and you flew it off, and uh, minimum, spool on, uh, minimum speed on final is about 185. So as you're coming in, as the, uh, the it gets slower and slower, the angle of attack keeps coming up, you finally reach a point where you don't have enough thrust to maintain that that speed. And as you get slower and slower, if a wing dips, you're going to have more lift on one wing than the other. So if the wing dips, you'll get yaw because you're getting more lift coming off one wing. The only way to get out of that is with rudder. If you use aileron, it gets worse and goes over. And in the beginning of the F, uh, Super Saber, uh, F-100 Super Saber time, it killed a lot of pilots because turning base to final, you tighten up your turn because you're overshooting a little bit and you're getting slower and the angle of attack's getting higher. If you don't use rudder to solve that problem, you, you're you going to be in pretty bad shape. Adverse yaw is the term. Adverse yaw. So when you when you try and take the, the, the aileron, take the turn out, it actually goes over right. and puts put you on the back and uh, it, it, it was really bad for a long time. Now the the nickname, only because it was so vivid, it, they called it the Sabre Dance, that piled up at Edwards, got behind the power curve and then it started going back and forth because he's ruddering it and he's aileroning it and the thing was like this until finally he lost control and it, it went in and uh, he blew up and killed him. But uh, they showed that movie to us before we ever got went out to the first airplane, they wanted to make an impression, and they did. Yeah, yeah. they did. You you learn real quick not to use aileron when you're low and slow. That's the first time I ever heard the whole story. I didn't know about the. I just remember seeing pictures of it. You, the, the, the F4 the, had real bad adverse yaw problem. And when yeah. I first started flying it, they said this is just like a T38 feet on the floor, no rudders required, and they they lost a bunch of guys. And then finally, was like, I think I think it's uh, specific to almost all swept wing swept wing airplanes. If you get low and slow, 
you got you you it and you start to get a wing walk, then you're gonna have more lift on one wing yeah. for a while and then yeah. it's Well the F four had a an aileron on top of the wing, very small. But on the on the other wing it had the one that would go down it was barn doors, really huge. So you would get you got a hell of a lot more drag. I don't know. What's yeah. I don't know. And after the after they figured it out, you know, as soon as you got anywhere near high angle of attack, just you know, when I was in I was in the back seat most of the time and I would just sit there I grab all the radar like that. Guy in front seat couldn't move the thing back, you know. Get black and blue here. <laughs> you, you, so anyway, let's let's go ahead. So yeah. So F one hundred, you get checked out, and your next assignment was Ramstein, Germany. I went uh, Ramstein. Uh, I went to Ramstein. We were a detached squadron from Bitburg. And the squadron name was? Or you know, uh, was? we were we were a Tiger squadron, the fifty third Tac Fighter squadron. And and what wing? Uh, Thirty six tactical fight fighter wing okay. at Bitburg. Right. So we were detached, and so I was flying F one hundred Cs. Uh, and I was only there for about seven months, seven, eight months, seven months. What, what months? Uh, I think I arrived there around October, November 1960, and then by the following summer I was in F-105 school at Nellis. So you got to fly through the worst weather in the world. Yes. <laughs> that sucked, didn't it? I tell you what, <clears throat> this is I went up to my, my flight commander uh, within a month of being there, and I'd been recovering all the time by myself in this lousy, really crappy weather. And I, I said, Brownie, when's a guy get to be a flight leader around here? And he looked at me, and he smiled, and he patted me on the head, because he was a big, tall guy. He patted me on the head, and he said, Hank, if you're alive in the spring, I'll make you one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it was just... Yeah, if you make it through a winter over there, uh, you're, you're seasoned. So did you guys fly uh, uh, single ship approaches or did you fly formation landings? Mostly single ship, but uh, uh, there were many occasions I, I did formation landings. I uh, lost my AC generator one time. The only thing I had was a battery sodium. I had, I had a radio, so since I had nothing to land with, uh, he took me down yeah. on his wing. And we did flying over there in Europe in, the, in, it, in those years, the, the winters were pretty severe. Yeah. And well, I was there in 66 to 68. Yeah. You go over there now and, and, and to Germany in the middle of summer, you could get 80s and 90 degrees. Yeah. Back then, I can remember one, went, uh, one summer where the joke was that summer came in on Wednesday and left on Saturday because we wore sweaters the, the whole summer. Yeah, yeah. So the, the the weather, the climate's changed a bit yeah, over it the was, years. It was rotten when I was there. There was, I remember in 68, over spring vacation, it was nice. But then the rest of the time it was cold and rainy and you know, yeah. it was just lousy. I lived, by, I lived on the Mosul River. Did you? So, yeah, that was pretty. That's where I met my wife. You know, so. She was a school teacher. I'm sure you were over there about the same time with the American school teachers. And, oh, yeah, yeah. I uh, yeah. I met my wife at Bitburg. Oh, uh, there you go. And she done a German. I mean, she was an Australian. She was with a bunch of Australians uh, traveling around Europe, and that's how I stumbled onto her. And here's a handsome fighter pilot. Oh yeah, an American at that. <laughs> well, we, we, we dated uh, on and off for about a year and a half. Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, so now, okay, compare flying ability, flying wise, an F-100 to an F-105. And if, let's say for F-100, well, you flew them clean a little bit, but most of the time you flew them with two tanks on, 300-gallon tanks, as I recall. Uh, 275s when okay. I was flying, but they, they upped them a little bit later on. And you probably went down to Wheelis? A uh, number of times, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, my whole three years over there, we were down there uh, probably twice a year yeah. uh, for gun, all the gunnery and air-to-air -air and everything. What was the name of the range? El Watia. There you go. El Watia. Yeah, yeah. By the way, do you remember Wheelis had one runway? Yep. I was coming back from the range down there one day, and I'm the last one back from the range, and I look down, and there's a light twin, collapsed the gear, and has the runway closed. And so I called Ops, and I said, uh, hey, uh, how long before you get that, that airplane off there? He said, oh, probably, they tell us about 40 minutes. I said, well, I've got 15 minutes of fuel. What are my options? Anyway, they. The options that turned out to be, 
uh, there was a it, Idris was a field down south of Tripoli. That's an emergency room, yeah. It went emergency field. Right. And then there was this long silence, and our boss came back and said, "Or you can have the taxiway." I landed 105 on that taxiway, and if you remember, they were very narrow. If you didn't keep your nose wheel on the center line, you, you could have your wheels in the dirt. And I'll tell you, that was the smallest, scariest runway I've ever landed on because it looked like you, were, you had to land on this strip and there's no barriers at the end. It was a 13,000 foot runway, though, as I recall. Yeah, so yeah. it's a long taxiway. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the point is, if I'd ever lost hydraulics or something, Did yeah, burner, yeah, okay. you could get through the, yeah, you could do it. And dive a little bit and get a transonic area. Yeah, you didn't Probably. do it much because yeah. it took so much fuel and uh, oh, yeah. then you had the wing tanks, you know, you're dragging things. Yeah, and I, you almost never flew clean. Does anybody ever fly supersonic? I mean, realistically. I mean, if you're doing dogfighting, you're going to break the sound barrier, but you're not going to do it as a typical. There's no reason to do it. The, the 105 was more critical. You know, the 105 was so clean. If you drop the nose and then pull the power back, you'd probably go through the mock. Really? Yeah. It was that clean. On my third flight in the, in the 105, I took it up 35,000, they gave us a quarter, put on autopilot, hugged in the burner, clean airplane, and watched the needle go to two. Wow. I mean, it could do it. it. It loved to go fast. And when I flew it, there was no max airspeed on the airplane. There are friends of mine that talked about coming off targets over in Vietnam, hitting 380, excuse me, 830 indicated. Well, I know it was difficult to put Mach 1.2 on the deck, you know, because that's how you got away from the bad guys. Yeah. Just put it in burner and roll. I don't it, know. It, it loved to go fast. It, matter of fact, the, 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 the speed, my, my whole time flying it over in Europe, the, uh, the speed schedule on takeoff, uh, gear up, flaps up, accelerate to 500, whole 500 to 0 0.9, 0 0.9 to wherever you want to go when it's come to, time to come back. Point nine, five hundred, plane. So you flew low levels. Low levels. Because uh, for Victor Alert, that's what Victor Alert is, is dropping nuclear bombs. So right. you've got to get down to low level to get in. Do you remember the airspeed and the altitudes you flew them at? Yes. Uh, typically, for practice, it's 500 feet. At uh, And we used 480 indicated. Because what's that, eight, eight, eight miles a minute? Yeah, right. Eight miles a minute. Yeah. Uh, and it was easy to do charts that way, but that was a practice thing. Yeah. Uh, one, but 480 is a, a, a mile speed for the 105. It really likes to go 550, 600. You could you could do 600 on a on a on a run and real easy, never even go burn. It. So then you you from the IP to the target 600. Yeah. Now the F4 was 420 and then 540. And you, when you would accelerate, it would unbelievable acceleration from 420 to 5 to 540. I needed always overshoot it. You know, it's just you know, those things have so much horsepower. You know. How much? What, how much thrust does a F105 have? The F105 had uh, 26,000 pounds. Oh wow! And that's with burner. Uh, it's grossed out at 52,000. Yeah, I think the F4 was lighter than that, but I think it weighed 29,000 dry. Well, this is full uh, fifty-two thousand fully loaded. I remember the first time I ever saw one up close. It was on the flight line at Del Rio, Texas. I went to Laughlin, and we were flying T-37s. And me and my roommate walked out one Sunday morning to look at these things. Good God, <laughs> it's just huge, you know. It, it's amazing. Uh, airplanes are if you've never been to one before and you go into a, you're upgrading to a bigger one, they always look huge. Yeah. Uh, I retired from TWA flying 747s. No, well, that's about as and, big as And it after be. a while, it was just another airplane. Uh, yeah, at the first time you you approach it, it's it's gigantic. Yeah. But after you get used to things, it's just another airplane. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I say, basic all. You know, it's all but what's between your uh, your eyes and, and your hands. That's pretty all you're seeing. You know, mm -hmm. you don't think about the mass in back of you so much. It, matter of fact, the, the, the commercial jets, you can't even see the wingtips. You don't even know where they are. You have to judge from... A friend of mine flies 737s with Southwest, and he said the first time he saw the wings of like that, he had taken off and he was cleaning things up. He looked at him, Jesus, where'd that come from? <laughs> <laughs> he said, surprised the heck out of him. He didn't know about it. You know. um, 
Okay, so now the difference. So now, okay, you upgrade. Where'd you upgrade, McConnell? To one hundred five. No, uh, I, I, I went to Ramstein, flew the F one hundred for about right. seven months. Then we had the oldest F one hundreds in the inventory, the C models, no trailing edge flaps. So we were the first ones to get the F one hundred five D, the old weather model. All right. So. Eight months later, I'm back in Nellis checking out in the F-105. Well, there enough. Hmm. So I went through the 105 school, then back to Ramstein, and at that point, they moved the squadron. We were detached squadron. They moved the squadron from Ramstein up to Bitburg. Logistics and parts and all that stuff. Uh, and then that's why I spent one year at Ramstein, two years at Bitburg. So you got to Bitburg in like 63? 61. 61. 61. I left Bitburg in 63. Yeah, it's where they had the good good deals on stereo equipment. Hi-fi. Hi-fi. Right, hi-fi. <laughs> Funny story. It inbound because of DC-3 with a, a two-star on it, and the, the base thought it was an ORI, and they were jumping through hoops, and, and the DC-3, the Goody Bird, lands, taxi down, pulls up outside of the hi-fi shop, he gets out, buys some hi-fi stuff, and leaves. <laughs> uh, were you excited about going to 105? Or? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Uh, you can, uh, I'm one of those guys, I, that's all I ever wanted to do is fly airplanes. And when they give you the world's fastest airplane, it goes Mach 2. I yeah. thought I died gun heaven. But we haven't had a single seat. Yeah. So the first time you fly it, you're all by yourself. Yeah. Thinking about the difference between the 100 and the 105. The 100 was sort of like, they give you a small old sports car with stick shift. And the 105 is like they give you a Cadillac with automatic. Wow. It was a comfortable cockpit. Everything was smooth about the airplane. It was honest. And it was very stable. It's really, it's, you could be going along at uh, 600 knots on somebody's wing, and you just sit there just as if you nothing was happening. Excuse me. That squadron that I was in over in Germany, Hindsight, I didn't realize that at the time, but it was one of the choice assignments in the Air Force, mainly because it was at Gramstein. It was a great right on the Autobahn, the big PX. It had everything you could go everywhere. In my squadron, and I'm just a, I, I walk in and I'm a second lieutenant. In my squadron, we had three guys who had just come off the Thunderbirds, two test pilots out of Edwards. Oh, wow. And before I left Pittsburgh, to give you an idea how People worked their way to go over there and get in this unit. The guy that came into my squadron just as I left was a guy named Jim Kessler. You will know him after I mention this. Nobody else in the military Air Force has ever gotten three Air Force crosses. Oh. Three of them. And he ended up as a POW. Oh, yeah. After I left. But he came into that squadron. That was the kind of quality of the people that were coming in. So as a young buck, I flew with eagles, yeah. not knowing. Yeah. I didn't know it. I just thought that nah, it just was guys, yeah. yeah. But uh, learned a lot. Okay, the 105 was a Cadillac. Now you flew for three years out of Ramstein. So then you just retired out of Ramstein then? No, one year out of Ramstein, two years out of Pittsburgh. Yeah, okay. Then I was assigned to analysis and IP in the F105. Okay. So I spent a year there. Uh, so for, you trained a lot of the guys that got shot down. I know a lot. Matter of fact, most of the books I read about Vietnam, I, I, I pick up names throughout the book. Well, they lost 335. I know. So I, spent a year, I think 295 in combat. I spent a year at Ramstein. Uh, I, I wanted out for a number of reasons. I didn't know anything about Vietnam. Uh, I resigned right at the Gulf of Tonkin. So you see, not much was going on before the Gulf of Tonkin. So the Gulf of Tonkin was... 64, late 64? About August, late to August 64. Okay. And that kind of started the whole thing. Well, by that time, I was on my way out of the Air Force. So I, I, what I did was I resigned in, um, at, in the autumn of 64. On my way to the East Coast, I thought I was going to go go to law school. Or, you know, that in my mind, I wanted to do nothing for 30 or 60 days. And then... Uh, plan my career and I thought I might go to law school and on my way to the East Coast I stopped for gas in Kansas City 
And as I'm getting gas, I look up and there's a billboard that says TWA. So I asked the gas station guy, I said, TWA big in this town? He said, you kidding? This is their headquarters. Pick up the phone, and 34 years later I retired from TWA as a 747 captain. <laughs> so sheer luck, being in the right place at the right time. And that's, that's uh, it was as simple as that. When did, so TWA became what? TWA became... TWA finally went under after a couple of corporate raiders just fleeced it of all its assets. Right. And it was a, a deal made through the, uh, the government that TWA went bankrupt uh, at midnight on, on Saturday night and at one in the morning American Airlines bought it. So TWA was merged into American Airlines uh, and American is the surviving company. Um, for instance, uh, I, I retired from TWA for my town, but I have a retirement pass on America. So, I went with TWA. They, they assigned me to Kennedy Airport, New York. That was going to be my base. And I grew up in the 50s where all I ever wanted to do is go in the Air, go in the Air Force and fly F 86s, the Sabre. Right. Because I grew up with John Wayne, you know, King of the Yalu, <laughs> shooting down MiGs. Sure. And I missed the airplane because by the time I got my wings, they said, oh, we, there are no more F-86 assignments. you got to go to the Super Saber now. So I get to New York and I went, I hear somebody talking, and apparently McGuire had F-86s. So I called up for an interview and they said, yeah, come on down. Didn't ask me any questions. They said, yeah, come on down. So I went down there for an interview and I walk in with my Form 5 and the guy says, what's your credentials? And I explained to him what I'd been doing. And he got a smile on his face and I thought, oh, this is going well. And finally he went like this, took me over to the window, pulled the curtain back, and there was 20 F-105Bs parked out on a ramp. They'd just gotten them a few weeks before. Two guys in the squadron were checked out. High man had 25 hours. And I was an ex-IP at an Ellis <laughs> with three years in the airplane. Oh, man. And he says, I think we can use you. So for the next year, while I was flying with TWA, they gave me an unlimited active duty, and I just checked out the whole squadron. They made up for the lousy pay on the TWA, right? Oh, yeah, it really <laughs> came. I was on $500 a month. Yeah. So how long did it take you to get, I would say you probably started off in 707, right? 707. I was a flight engineer. Started out as a flight engineer. Right. And so they had a bunch of flight engineers in New York, so I hardly ever flew with TWA. I was just... Uh, one of the reserves. So I put in almost full time down at the guard at McGuire. And then about a year later, TW asked me to come to Kansas City to their training center to be a, uh, an instructor, a flight engineer instructor, and a check engineer. And I took the job for a number of reasons, but uh, I, that's when I gave up my military flying for good. So it would be 66 or so? Uh, January 66. I went, I went to Kansas City. I was a check engineer on 707s for maybe... But how do you want to... I mean, I, I can't believe you'd give up flying a 105. To... Well, by that time, I'd flown it for four years. No. I'm not saying the thrill was gone. I'm just saying that uh, I was looking ahead to my future. And I just, uh, I just gotten married. And my first baby was on the way, and I was thinking, maybe there's a, maybe there's something here that if they want me. In and it is dangerous after all. <laughs> no, that never bothered me. I, I, I was typical. Uh, I used to say that I was just what the Air Force wanted. I was young, stupid, and invincible. You know, and that that give me give me a hundred of those guys, we'll go to war. Well, like like Ange was saying last week, not me. <laughs> I can't believe this is happening, you know. <laughs> and I had an interesting thing happen to me. Uh, while at TWA, while I was in a training center. Within TWA, we had uh, a lot of uh, professional flight engineers from the Constellations and, and all the airplanes. Well, when the FEIA, Flight Engineer Union, and ALPA, the pilot union, merged, they allowed the flight engineers who were young, uh, 45 years old or younger to check out as a co-pilot if they had the, the, the licenses. Right. So 
because they didn't have a lot of time, they took all the domestic co-pilot slots. So my first co-pilot slot that I was eligible to get was international co-pilot on 707. So I had to go and get an ATR, a rating on a 707. My background, zero co-pilot time in my life, zero multi-engine time. And so I was going to go get a rating. And my boss at the training center had been talking about an experimental program. It was the forerunner of the simulator rating, where you did everything in the simulator. Well, back then the simulators were very primitive. So much so, if you can imagine, they were all run by IBM cards. And the visual wasn't all that good. So he asked me to volunteer for a, 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 an experiment. And he says, if it doesn't work out, We'll let you go back. We'll just act like it never happened. Just put you back through the regular program. And the idea was, give me as much simulator as I needed, and as little airplane time. So, I was very familiar with the simulator because I was a check engineer in there. And one of the reasons they asked me is because they knew I wouldn't have any trouble with the airplane mechanics and how it was all put together. In other words, all the only thing they had to worry about me was the flying. He put me up for a rating ride on a 707 at five and a half hours, airplane time, and I passed. And the FAA and my instructor were sort of like asshole buddies, but they were always in sort of a pissing contest. And so my instructor says, well, write them out a ticket. And the FAA guy says, I can't do that. I said, why not? He says, well, your manual, your policy manual, calls for a minimum of eight hours, and he doesn't have it. <laughs> do you know they made us go out and waste a couple hours shooting landings, come back, and I had to do the whole rating ride all over again. And this, so that's what that's what you had in your, uh, yeah. that's that black thing that I saw. Yeah, that's, uh, my, uh, that's the old license. I've got the new one in my pocket. Yeah, okay. But, uh, well, I've never so, seen one before, so. Well, the, the fact that I, I did so well, they brought me back in a little later. Well, we bought two Lockheed Jet Stars and we bookered the system a little bit to make them airborne simulators. And this was in the mid 60s, we hired a whole bunch of commercial instrument ticket 200 hour Cessna pilots because the war was going on, Vietnam War. They weren't letting the pilots out. And all the airlines were hiring. So the pilot pool just dried up like it is today. It just dried up. So now we have a bunch of light airplane pilots with commercial instrument sitting in the flight engineer seat. And after a couple of years, all, now they've got a co pilot's bid. And now they're going to go from Cessna 150 or whatever they were flying to the right seat on a 707. The gap is huge. So if these guys could get through the simulator, and most of them did, then I would get them, and the company brought me in, and I flew these Lockheed Jet Stars. I would give them six hours, and we'd just go out and bring them from light airplane to the jet world. And it was a fun job. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, the FAA didn't really care about it because it was, quote, an experiment. So they never even come out and look at me, and I just had a lot of fun. And my, matter of fact, my briefing to these guys was: this is the only only flying program in your entire life that you cannot fail. There's no pass or fail. We're going to try and learn as much as we can in six hours about jet age, flying jets, and uh, all the different maneuvers that you know they're going to have to do in the big airplane. But the idea was to take a, a 707 out of, out of service to use it for practice is very expensive. We're losing money here and it's costing us money here. So that's why we bought the two Lockheed Jet Stars to use them as the transition from one to the other. Like, you know, once you fly a, a jet. But then they have, you know, the stories of guys going from transport type airplanes to jet fighters. Apparently it doesn't work out that well. No, it doesn't. And they found that out in World War II, big time, whenever they tried it. And they tried it in, in Vietnam. 
Yeah. And I went to survival school, and one of the guys in the class was a 119 pilot. I said, I'm going to get killed. I can't fly those things. Are you kidding me? And they're going to put him in the front seat. And yeah. Who knows what happened, you know? You know, when I, re when I resigned from the Air Force, <clears throat> I had, put, had my paperwork in, and it was going up through the channels, and they couldn't talk me out of getting out. I ended up getting an airline to hand me an airline ticket, and I flew me to Langley. And a two-star counseled me, counseled me about my career possibilities and staying in the service because I had a regular commission. Oh, you would have, yeah, at that time, you've been uh, at yeah. least a full colonel. That's what he said. At least. Yeah, that's what he said. When I, class 60C pilot training, when we showed up, now you, you know all the gymnastics you got to go through just to get into pilot training and what have you. So now here we are, uh, I don't know. 300 or four, three, three, 400 guys showing up at San Antonio. The very first day, you know what the colonel says who gets up and addresses us? The needs of the service have changed. We don't have flying slots for one third of you. We have to wash out one third of you. And he said, the competition starts now. And they just ran us all back through a whole battery of physicals. And boy, it was cut and slash for those first few months in pilot training. If your performance today wasn't better than yesterday, you were up for an evaluation right. And you can imagine the amount of pressure that put on you. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was just slash, slash, slash. So when this two starts, I think he was director of personnel, uh, was counseling me, he was showing me charts of how when we were hired, how they'd reduced the number of uh, pilots they needed so that 20 years later, there's going to be a shortage of graded pilots for command positions. And that was a sales pitch. You know, you're, you're crazy kid. You know, you don't know what you're doing. And uh, I'm a pig headed. Yeah. <laughs> my mind had already been made up. And I have no regrets, even to this day, because my career was about as good as it could be. Yeah, I had a 07. And by the, the next airplane after that would be. Okay, 707s, uh, my next airplane was a Convair 880 out of Chicago, which was a great airplane to fly. Uh, it was fast, easy to fly, it had a GE engine that had variable stators. Ooh, so, nice. Throttle, yeah. So you push the throttle up and you got power pretty yeah, quick, right, as yeah. opposed to the old Pratt & Whitney's that took forever to yeah, spool right. up. And then after that airplane, um, the company, I was still living in Kansas City, and the company asked me to come back and fly those Lockheed Jet Stars. Right. I did that for a while, and then uh, moved out here to San Diego, 1971. I've been here 47 years. Oh, that's when we moved here, too. And um, decided to uh, park my family in Poway, and I, would, I was willing to commute to anything. And so the family got to grow up and go to the same schools mm, and then yeah, same friends. Yeah. And I flew, uh, well, in Kansas City, I upgraded, finally upgraded to Captain on DC 9s. So I flew Captain on DC 9s, 727s, 707s, 767s, What's early airplane uh, when you got it down slow and on final. Really? Because it was so dirty. If you look at it, oh, yeah. it's so dirty that the difference between five and ten knots, you could fall out the bottom and go bang on a landing. And one, and, and you'd be sitting there wondering, well, why? I did everything the same as I've done the last six, ten times. Yeah. Uh, it was an okay airplane. So uh, when did you get the 747? And flew that for quite a while. It was, it's a comfortable airplane and it's easy to fly. The, only, the 747, is, was designed to be easy to fly. Because when you see it landing, have you ever noticed the, the landing wheels? Mm -hmm. The trucks are just sitting up there and they go squeak, yeah. squeak. Yeah. The biggest problem with the airplane is uh, a strong crosswind landing. Just stop and visualize this. There's a lot of sight, yeah. You, you're not landing like this. You're landing, your nose, you, you may be up in the nose and you're out over the, land, the, 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 the side runway oh, lights. Oh, wow. And the main gear is 100 foot behind you and it's in the center of the runway. 
So you're not landing yourself. You're landing something that's oh, 100 man. feet behind. There's a same in Lockheed 1011. But the, 70, the 747, that, that, that would took a, a, a bit of an adjustment to figure out when you get down to the runway, how are you going to get this crab out and get the nose over to the center without dropping a pod and clipping an engine out? How'd you do it? Very tactfully. Rudder? Just rudder? rudder. Uh, whatever it takes. Uh, but when you flew in a place like Lodges and places like that, you always had a lot of wind, right? Yeah. One of the interesting uh, landing, auto landing systems was on the Lockheed 1011. Right. It was Category 3A. Category 3A is uh, 100 meters RVR, about 300 feet. Yeah, right. To do a Category 3 landing, and I did about four of them in London over the years, the airport has to be certified Category 3, the airplane has to be certified, the pilot has to be certified for the airplane to go in and land. Now when you come in and land, you have three autopilots and they're all looking at each other. If one autopilot disagrees with any of the others, it gets kicked out, big red light, and you go around. So you have all three autopilots monitoring each other. The airplane comes in, you feel the wheels touch on, you do not see anything. Because on the wide bodies, the big ones, the nose is still so far up in the air that you're up in the, in the fog. So you feel the wheels touch, the autopilot lowers the nose to the runway, tracks right down the center, and at this time you can, you can start seeing a, a few centerline lights right in front of your nose, and it, you just put it in reverse and come to a stop. Wow. And it does it smooth. Now here's the kicker. The pilot is not authorized to land the airplane. Only the autopilot. Wow. And this is a 1970... Hey, this is 30 years ago I was doing this. Yeah. 25, 30 years ago. I'm retired 20 years. And I was doing it back in the early 1990s. Well, they must have some good stuff now. Today, yeah, it's got to be, well... well probably GPS now. They have drones landing and taking off all by themselves today. Wow. But it was a good system, and you might you might question uh, how do you get how do you get enough faith to allow it to do it. I was going to St. Louis one day, and it had a 20, 23 knot direct crosswind, and I hooked the whole thing up. It was VFR. Hooked the whole autopilot system up. It went in, lowered the wing into the the, the crosswind. Put the airplane on, took out the crab, went squeak, squeak, and did a better job than I could have ever done. And it had a 23 knot crosswind. Now, with 100 RVR, you know the wind's going to be almost zero. Yeah, right. So it's a piece of cake. Yeah. Well, so uh, skipping ahead to another subject, you had a little altercation on board a 747. 707. 707. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Um, back in. Uh, early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, hijackings were prevalent. I had one out of uh, LAX. It was a, a red... That's what I love about these pilot groups that I belong to and I, I run a couple of them. Oh, and that's what, that's what we I want to... We never run out of stories. Well, talk, that's what I wrote myself a note. Ask about the OBs. Tell me about the. Tell me about these two things, and oh. the Dedalians. Tell me about. Okay, Dedalians is uh, ex-military pilots, uh, active I, and retired. I thought Dedalians was open to almost anybody. No. Well, what they said last week. Here's what's happened. It, it originally designed for retired pilots. Right. Actually, and active pilots. You've got to be a military pilot at right. some time. Yeah. And what's happening is it's dying out. They're not getting enough replacement people to have interest. So they've opened it up to backseaters, uh, flight surgeons who dealt with a lot of pilots. And you can have guests whenever you want. So it, it's, it's pretty loose now but because when they're trying to keep it When alive. did it start? You know, I don't know. Uh, uh, it, it must have started way, way back, uh, World War II probably. 
after the war? The QBs are World War One. I, I know that. QBs, 1921. Oh, um, so it was post I'm, the war. I'm the governor of the, the hangar up in North County. Uh, I went there a couple of years ago when uh, Jeff, Jeff Watkins was there. The English pilot who flew Lancasters. Oh, yeah. And he helped flip over the, the Tirpitz. Yeah, yeah. And I, but I keep asking because he, I was going to interview him, and he said, well, "Why don't you just come along to this thing?" Do you so, know that Kurt Schultz was flying M109s mm -hmm. up in northern. Same time, yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, they 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 launched him to go for the attack on the on the Tirpitz. Tirpitz, but too late. And they got there too late. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, no, they they they, they, were, they killed about twelve hundred people. There were a lot of men that drowned in that thing. Yeah, I would they, imagine. They just rolled it upside down. Is what they did. Quiet Burden is. Uh, you got you got to be a pilot, minimum 500 hours pilot in command just just to be accepted. World War One, after the war was over, a bunch of guys from flying and over there uh, in World War One, fighter pilots, living in the New York area, decided, hey, let's get together and have a little reunion. I hate to lose track of all you guys, so they got together at a at a bar. Restaurant. I was going to say they have a Denny's there too. And no, they had a, the, the, it's the same they, idea. Matt was at a place called Marty's. It's the same idea, though. Yeah. Right. So, so they had this big night of uh, drinking and eating and what have you, and all of a sudden the news media heard about. It. So they come in to cover it at one of their meetings, and one of the writers, newspaper people, nicknamed him Quiet Birdman because they were so noisy. You know how Tiny's always yeah. the the big guy. Yeah, sure. Uh, so that's how they got the name Quiet Birdman. And as it expanded, uh, it started in 1921. Just about every famous pilot that you could ever imagine has been a member of uh, Quiet Bird. Yeah. We today we have 214 hangars around the United States, and uh, in San Diego County we have two. One is San Diego. It's called San Diego. Pretty much the, the lower half, and then the group that I'm with is the northern. Part of San Diego, yeah. we call ourselves Palomar Hangar, yeah. but they're they're all over the country, and uh, we have a speaker every uh, every meeting. We we have luncheons, and they the other hangar has dinners, so a little bit different atmosphere, different group. Ours is a lot older because uh, most guys have a job, we're, the young guys got a job, so we're mostly retired people, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, we average about. 40, 45 guys every oh, wow. every month. I run another group up here, Rancho Bernardo. That's uh, it's called. Uh, it's gonna sound weird. We used to we started with four guys having coffee, talking airplanes. Outside of a a place called Sydney's Delicatessen, <laughs> and we'd get there. It's a, like a food mart. We get there early in the morning. We get all the chairs, and we, we'd run about an hour and a half, tell stories, do everything. And everybody going to Sydney's to get a coffee and a bagel or something like that. So one day, when it got from four, it started growing, getting bigger. Somebody said, we need a name. So, jokingly, and it was accepted, was bagels and bologna. You buy your bagels at Sydney's, and we provide the bologna out here. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so that, that's how we got our name. And I now run it, uh, a number of things happened. We lost our place there because they remodeled. I run it every Friday morning in uh, Remington Club in Rancho Bernardo, which is near, right, just alongside Vaughn's. It's a retirement community, retirement home, and uh, I average 25 to 30 guys every Friday morning. Oh, wow. That's and what we do is I sit around, I moderate it, and we just tell stories. And it's so much fun. I don't know on... From Friday to Friday, where the one other guy will show up, but I'm getting 25 to 30. Wow. We probably have a total of maybe 50, and on average, we get 25 to 30 show up. So I, I run it at, at that club, and it, it, it's, it's, it's humming along really nice.